After 17, we'll begin in verse 1 and read down to <clears throat> verse 11. Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together at Shoko, which belongeth to Judah, and pitched between Shoko and Azekah in Ephes Damin. And Saul and the men of, of Israel were gathered together <clears throat> and pitched by the valley of Elah <clears throat> and set the battle in array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side. And there was a valley between them. <clears throat> and there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. And he had a helmet of brass upon his head, and when his arms were the coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs, and a target of brass between his shoulders. Hold on a second. <coughs> and the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and the spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and one bearing a shield went before him. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel, and said unto them, why are you come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a, a Philistine and ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you, let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the, the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard the words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we thank you for the reading of your word. We thank you for the story that we're going to look at, <clears throat> the ramifications of it. We thank you for the, the message this morning, dealing with the same uh, person. And <clears throat> we just ask that you move on our behalf. Uh, familiarity with things sometimes allows us to uh, take things for granted, and that's true even of your word. Uh, I can remember growing up and hearing uh, this story, and yet it wasn't until after I was saved that I got anything out of it. It just looked like a, a nice story. And so now I pray tonight that we would all see together through the power of the Holy Spirit uh, what he is uh, uh, hopefully revealing to all of us and that we would take these things and use them for your honor and for your glory. As always, I pray that everybody here in attendance is saved. I would hope that, I would think that, but I'm not sure. I would hope that everybody watching is, is the same. And again, I'm not sure. So. I pray that if, there, if that's not the case, that you would just work through, again, the, the gospel message and the conviction of the Holy Spirit and that they would come to Christ before it is eternally too late. Uh, and since today is the day of salvation, that would mean today, tonight, right now. And so we ask all this now in Jesus' name, amen. And again, I said in my prayer, this is familiar ground. Uh, for anyone that was raised in a Bible-believing Baptist church and also in a non-believing church. I mean, these are, these are stories that, that are taught even among uh, Christian science and Seventh-day Adventists and Mormons and, and so forth with their own little spin on it. Uh, it takes us a long time in the chapter before... Uh, David, who is a, a young man, probably a teenager at this point, uh, issues this remarkable question to the Israelite army and King Saul in verse 29. And David said, what have I now done? Is there not a cause? Uh, and uh, we're not gonna go that far. And, and you'll, you'll see why here momentarily. In the text of our, our chapter, the Israelites and the Philistines were meeting for war. Uh, the people of God versus the enemy of God's people. 
In verse 1, we're introduced to the area in which the Philistines prepared to meet and logically speaking to defeat the very inadequate uh, Israelites. And so verse 1 again it talks about the, the Philistines gathered their armies, plural, to battle. And such were gathered together at Shoko, which belongs to Judah, and pitched between Shoko and Zika. Now, if you have an atlas, you can go southwest, uh, south, southwest of about 20 to 25 miles, and you can find these two cities, Zika on the top, Shoko below it, and the the area that we're going to talk about through there in the Valley of Elah, which is off to the left a little bit. Uh, so we're dealing about something that's close by, by Jerusalem. And this, this Ephes Damim is uh, the, the place, I want to, I want to define the, the actual, this is a place, it's not a city, it's a place between these two, and it is the, the place or boundary of blood. It's, it's interesting, we'll, we'll deal with that. Frequently battles were fought at this location. Uh, and over time, the name of the warring factions uh, have changed, but the place where they met in battle has remained the same. Uh, and so this is the way that the Philistines are, are presented to us in God's word. Uh, they were permanently at war with the Israelites. They always were for whoever was against the nation of Israel. They were cruel and never lost the will to fight. And they were quick to invade Israel at the slightest sign of weakness. Uh, do you think there are any, any people close by the nation of Israel that are like that today? Yes, they're there. They've never quit. They're called by different names, but they're there. So we will treat the Philistines, therefore, as a type, I mean, it's, it's literal, as a type of the world that obstructs, that opposes, and that enslaves the people of God. When you leave here, you and I are going into the territory of the Philistines. Before you came here, you were among them in certain regards. Everywhere we go, we, we encounter these enemies of God. Uh, mostly these people don't mind if you give them your money, if you buy their products. But when it comes to the gospel, when it comes to the Lord Jesus Christ, then it's a different story. So. Uh, whether you call it the world or, or the boundary of blood, uh, it is a place of continual warfare. And we know we're in a spiritual war. Uh, we, we are in dealing with spiritual warfare. It, it, it's not seen. It's hopefully not in here, but it can be. And when we get leave here, it's going to occur uh, just as soon as uh, we left, it, left off it. We experience... We experience Conflicts dealing with morality, the battle for truth, uh, and a never-ending war for the souls of those who are lost. That will never end. It used to be uh, early on when I was saved and in school, it used to be a lot easier to explain to people and they listened, they were receptive, they weren't as hostile, they weren't as, as uh, negative, they weren't as smart. And I don't mean that in a smart sense, but, it, you know, you, you think you're so smart. Uh, none of that prevailed then. Today, it, it's much harder. But you're in a never-ending war for, this, for them. You, you have to realize you don't change your message. You don't change your method. You just keep giving it out. Right? Uh, Bob Jones Sr. Uh, used to say, I never heard him say this. I read it that he said it. He says, you go find a hole and you take the gospel gun and you put that gun down the hole and you shoot. If nothing comes up, shoot again. And keep shooting until something comes up. Uh, we had a person in, in our church in Greenville who was an officer in the church. Had been for years and years. And one day, under the preaching of, of that particular pastor, realized he was lost. 
all those years. And but he just kept firing away with the gospel in, in, in the word. And suddenly he came to, the, to grips with himself that he had never received Christ as Savior. So if you, if you don't keep doing this, how, how are people going to understand? If we back off and we compromise, it, it, it just won't be, be uh, what we try to accomplish. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to equate them with some things here and understand what I'm using them as a type of the world. Uh, the Philistines run the public schools. They are in charge. Parents used to be in charge. No more. They run it. And do uh, you think, well, I'll ask some questions here. Um, the Philistines are rampant in Hollywood. It's almost like can any good thing come out of Hollywood? Uh, the Philistines have forceful representatives in the religions of the world. And they own and operate the pornography industry the abortion gas chambers, and the alcohol and drug trade. They're involved in all of that. And it's sad that many of God's people hide out for fear uh, of getting into the front lines uh, and getting as far away as they can to avoid the conflict. We're in a warfare. I mean, this is spiritual. This isn't, you know, just dealing with, you know, cultural things. Uh, and, and nevertheless, the boundary of blood is outside the doors. And the enemy is, will, is waiting. And he's infiltrated many churches today. Uh, I would love to say that our independent fundamental Baptist churches are exempt. But they're not so. Not so. Uh, and, it, and it could happen here just as easy. So I'm going to start here in the first three verses. And it shows us the camp of the enemy. I'm not going to read them again. But I, I, want, to make, I want to reemphasize that it was the armies versus the, the men of Israel. They, just, they, were just a, they had an army. So they were, let's, let's face it, they were vastly outnumbered. Uh, besides this, this creepy guy. All right. And they... If, if you remember what we read in verse 1, they had already invaded and took over what rightfully belonged to the people of God, Shoko and Ezekiah. They were, they were there. They had, they had overtaken them. Uh, but here, here's something important. The enemy can only occupy what we yield to them. Uh, James chapter 4, verse 7, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Ephesians 4, 27, neither give place to the devil. You don't open the door. You don't even, you don't even, you don't even unlock the lock. Because if, when you unlock the lock, a lot of times the door will swing and there's a little gap in there. You don't do that. You, that's what that means. You don't give place to the devil. Romans six thirteen. neither yield ye, ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin. Extremely important. Uh, they will take what we give them through our indifference, our ignorance, our compromise, or our disobedience. And we think we're trying to win them that way. No, we're not winning them. They're, they're just moving. They're, they're steamrolling right over us, smashing us in, into the ground. Uh, we're shown verses 2 and 3, the preparation for the engagement. They're on opposite hillsides. Now, this is important. There is a, a small valley that runs between them with a deep ravine, somewhere in the, in the area of a, of a mile. And in some places, it was as deep as 10 feet. So there were only certain places that you could cross over. Both sides knew that. So as long as they stayed on each side, nothing was, was going to take place. They knew exactly where the conflict would take place. You and I have to know where the enemy of, uh, enemies of God are seeking to drive us from the things that rightfully belong to us. Education. Counsel. Do you realize... 
what's, what's happened with counseling? We gave it up a long time ago. We decided to farm it out. And it's, and it's been impossible to draw it back in. But we're supposed to be able to counsel each other. We don't have to go to a shrink. We don't have to go to somebody who, who mixes the Bible and, and with, with the social uh, infidelity that's you know, stereotyping you. Uh, you are a product of God as a, as a saved person. You have the indwelling Holy Spirit and with the word of God and, and, and you're listening to that, the solution is there. It really is. Uh, so, who's going to teach our children the truth? If we don't. The Philistines? Jehovah Witnesses? Seventh-day Adventists? Who's going to teach them? Who's, go who's going to teach our men and women the truth? If they, go, if they go to a church and somebody reads, reads a scripture and closes the book and the rest is just social gospel or jokes or comedy hour, who's going to teach them? They, <clears throat> I've talked to so many people that have been in so many different churches that, that know nothing. Is that, is that what this is, church is all about? That you, you go through the motions and <clears throat> you attend, you pay your money and that's all there is to it? You, there's no growth if you are saved. Uh, it, it just doesn't matter. Who's going to teach them if, if we don't do it? Uh, I, I can't. I was saying before church, I don't, I don't want anybody to think that, that we are the only person, the only group doing something. At the same time, I don't know what other people are doing. I just know that I've got a word here that I don't, ha I don't have a life left to cover everything that's in there. And neither do you. We don't have a guarantee on tomorrow. We have today. So why not get as much as we can from, from here today so we can do something with it? Who's going to teach the truth about morality and character if we don't? And, and uh, you know where I'm going. And where it's all this found? It's found in the Word. And once you abandon the Word, you're gone. It's, a, it's just a matter of time before anybody finds it out. Who's going to tell us the truth about a six-day, literal, 24-hour creation? The schools? Literature? No. They mock us. Who's going to, who's going to, tell, the, who's going to tell the truth about truth? I mean, that is, is even gone. Who's going to define the family? Do you know that there are people that maintain that they are saved people that have, that have abandoned the war when it comes to this? So, oh, we, we, want, to, we, we want peace. Well, if you want peace, you do it at the, at the, at the sacrifice of truth. What is the biblical definition? A biological man and a biological woman. Is there anything else? No. That's it. Anything else is an aberration. Anything else is not truth. Who's going to define human sexuality? We're less than two weeks from what the Philistines have designated it as Pride Month. Now isn't it ironic? Isn't it circumstantial? Isn't it coincidental that the theme parks are ready to open up in early June? You know, the, any of you eat Skittles? Do you know how long Skittles has been around? and used a, 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 a rainbow for their, for their product? Well, do you know what? The activists, the Philistine activists, have said, you can't do that. So what did they do? Well, they have so much character. They have so much dignity. 
that they changed it to gray. No backbone, spineless. Is that what we're going to do? No. I mean, are we going to adhere to, the, to a biblical standard? Uh, uh, a biblical standard of, of uh, what about the, the standard of preservation of the Word of God? Who's standing for that anymore? Well, there's groups. Some of them are nutty, and, and others are right on. Well, we, we have a preserved Word of God. If we don't, then we're no better than the ones that are taking out and adding to and saying, oh, well, uh, this isn't, he wasn't right there, and so forth. Uh, and hopefully, well, the question is, will we defend the truth? It's worth standing for. How are we going to define right and wrong apart from this? All right, in verse 4, we, we move to the champion, the world's champion. There went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. So we're in the approximation of nine and a half feet. This is 11 foot, 18 inches smaller than the ceiling. That's a pretty big guy, pretty big. Uh, that's his appearance. Now, over time, and you know archeology span was, was started to disprove the scriptures. They, they wanted, there's a group of people and they wanted to go out there and, and they were skeptics and they wanted to find that the things that the Bible said were not there or were not true. Well, they unearthed skeletons. They unearthed large, gigantic skeletons in, in Jordan, in the area of Jordan Valley. Uh, and they, they maintained that they had been there for hundreds of years. And we say, well, there couldn't have been anybody that big. That's just almost as ridiculous as Jonah and the whale. No, they were there. They were there. Uh, he certainly was any, he was larger than any Israelite soldier. And anybody who underestimated the threat from him would be foolish and dead. Verse 5. And he had an helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the, whale, the, whale, the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass, and he had greaves of brass upon his legs, and a target of brass between his shoulders, and the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and the spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and one bearing a shield went before him. Okay, everything about this is, is humongous. Everything about this is heavy. Uh, I, don't, I don't want to deal with the weights, because everybody's got a different idea of what the weights mean according to different, different things. But there definitely was a lot of weight created on his head and on his chest and on his legs. I mean, I don't, only he would be able to walk in this thing. Only he would be able to move in this thing. It's so heavy. The, the spear, like a weaver's beam. You know what today we, we use, outside here when we had the fence, the four by fours are there. That's the size of the shaft, a four by four. And, uh, and incredibly heavy. And so this, this is a, a, um, a man that was dressed to kill and not to be killed. Go over to verse 16. I'm kind of skip ahead here. And the Philistine drew near morning and evening and presented himself 40 days. 40 days. That's interesting. He defied the Israelite armies for 40 days. The amount of times in the scriptures that 40 days is mentioned obviously is telling. 40 days, it rained. 40 days and 40 nights. Genesis 7, 12, the rain on the earth. In Exodus 24, 18, Moses went up to be on the mount with the Lord for 24 days, I mean 40 days, interceded for the nation of Israel and you know, what they were doing down there. Uh, the spies were 40 days into Canaan land. The amount of years that the Israelites spent in the wilderness was 
a year for every day of unbelief. So they were 40 days, and the Israelites were 40 years in the wilderness for unbelief. Do you know what unbelief costs? It costs a lot. You get in the habit of whatever this book says, I'm going to believe it. I may not understand it, but I'm going to believe it. Um, okay, I think we need to understand that the Philistines represented, not the literal, obviously, are always going to meet us with things that are bigger and more powerful than we are. So if you'll turn back to Deuteronomy chapter 20. <clears throat> Deuteronomy chapter 20. Now, we're, we are not Israel. Don't think that we are. I'm going to take an application off of this. <clears throat> Deuteronomy 20, look in here in verse 1. When thou goest out to battle against thine enemies, and seest horses and chariots and a people more than thou, be not afraid of them, for the Lord thy God is with thee, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And it shall be, when ye are come nigh unto the battle, that the priest shall approach and speak unto the people, and shall say unto them, Hear, O Israel, ye approach to stay unto battle against your enemies. Let not your hearts faint, fear not, do not tremble, neither be terrified because of them. For the Lord your God is he that goed with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. I believe we are people of God, and I believe that the Lord undertakes for us when we engage in spiritual warfare, and remember to keep the armor, the whole armor of God on you at all times. All right, Ephesians chapter 6. All right, verse 8. And he stood and cried to the, unto the enemies of Israel, and said unto them, Why are you come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine, and ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you, and let him come down to me. Uh, am not I a Philistine, and you servants to Saul? Recon the Philistines recognized there was a difference between themselves and Israel. The Philistines today understand there's a difference between themselves and the people of God. They understand that. What I don't understand is why we try to be like the Philistines and think we're going to win them. When they understand, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? You're not like us. Or maybe you are like us. You're just saying you're not like us. All right? Uh, when it comes down to it, they hate the things we stand for. They really do. And, and they hate that we trust the Lord, that we can depend on the Lord to see us through and, and undertake for us. They are the enemy. And we remember that in John chapter 15, the Lord was speaking to the disciples. If the, if the world hated him, it's also going to hate them as it hated him. And yet we, we think, no, 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 we've got, he had it all wrong. We can make friends with the world. Well, then you become the enemy of God, James chapter 4. You can't. You can't make friends with it. You have to realize, you can use it, but you can't make friends with it. It, it just doesn't, it doesn't work. Uh, but why do so, so, so many of our own not recognize the differences? Or, and passively, uh, act, you know, act passively toward the things that, the, that they are taking from us, or have taken. His declaration in verse 9, your servants, his servants. If he, be able, if he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall see, you shall be our servants and serve us. Listen, don't make any mistake what the battles are about. The world wants you to submit to its bondage. And the world is in bondage. You already know that. You that came out of the world know it. And make us servants to its agenda to conform us, conform us to its standards and worldly principles. There is no peaceful coexistence. I like those little hippie signs on the back of cars that have the thousand and five stickers. Peacefully coexist. 
It's impossible. It is impossible. There won't be any peace until Christ returns. <laughs> Israel still can't figure that out. Uh, they want us to return to the world. Why? What do they have that we want? Well, they, they have the niceties of today. They have the luxuries of today. Well, you need to study a little bit of history, like the Inquisitions. What, what happened to those people? You signed a statement that you believe in the Mass, and you believe in the Confession, and you believe in the Pope, and you can live. I'm sorry, I'm not going to do that. Well, then we're going to kill you. Okay, go ahead and kill me. What, what's going to happen with, with the Muslim insofar as the true Muslim in teaching is that we will let you live if you renounce the faith and become a Muslim. No, I'm not going to do that. Off with your head. I mean, we are, we've been sold a bill of goods here. There is no peaceful coexistence. It's one side. It's like the old and new, new nature. One side must be dominant. It's going to dominate. Do, I'm sorry, dominate. Uh, his, his decision or his defiance here in verse 10 and the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel. Do you notice how the media, how higher education, the Hollywood and political elites laugh and mock and ignore what they view us as the threat of Christianity? China won't let more than 12 people get together. They don't even like 12 because they're afraid that they, they are a threat to overthrow the government. Isn't that nonsense? We're not, we're, we are not here to overthrow the government. In, in the United States, if you're here to overthrow the government, you're making a big mistake. You need to go down into Arkansas where all these people are and they're gonna, you know, they're, they've been storing up ammunition for decades and they think that they're gonna you know, win this, this fight. No, we're not gonna, you won't win that one. They throw the, the giants of humanism and evolution and communism and socialism and feminism and relativism as though, you know, we can't stand up to these things. Well, I guess not if we're not going to stand for it and, and defend it. They dare us to impede their progress by trying to eliminate us from, from giving out the word. We're... You know you're regarded as irrelevant. We're, we're dispensable. Uh, wouldn't be surprised if, if uh, in the manufacturing of a virus, they could manufacture a virus that killed Christians. Just as easy as they manufactured this one. Uh, and how do you do that? By legislating error and falseness. If I speak out, and I haven't, haven't gotten really descriptive yet, if I speak out on some of the things that are culturally now legal, it's hate speech, even though God said it. So they're saying God hates. Well, you're, you're right, he hates sin. If the things are sinful, then why shouldn't we speak out and say, you know, God says, I'm not hateful toward them. God says, this is hateful. This is an abomination. All right, so look at their reaction. Verse 11, when Saul and all the Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed. They were dismayed and greatly afraid. Dismayed and greatly afraid. This entire army was immobilized by the sight of one person. Yes, he was a giant, it doesn't matter. Crippled by fear when they should have, when they should have been uh, triumphing in faith that God was with them and he would give them the victory. They saw only the size of the giant, forgetting the size of the true and living God. 
Is there a message maybe today to us in light of this giant virus in which we have been prodded for fear on to live and hole and crawl into, into the pulpits and under rocks for months on end and opposing any opposition censoring it on mainstream platforms only to find out that less than a month ago the opposition was right do you remember in the early parts of inventions when people created things and they had scientific discoveries do you know what happened to a lot of those people they were killed they were killed they said, no there's no way that that can be that well here you remember the two dogs in california boy youtube bumped them immediately and then a bunch of other people got things knocked off you know what they were saying the very thing that the uh, the the elite mr go both ways fauci said if you stay holed up you're gonna you you're going to do more harm to yourself than if you got out into public what didn't this expert say if you go out we're gonna everybody's gonna die so stay in and we've got governors that are still holding people up so what is it are we going to trust the Lord are we going to trust somebody that doesn't know what he's talking about I mean this I'm using this for the purpose that it should be used for these are these are Philistines these, these are mighty people they have they can do destructive things but we have a true and living God we have the truth of the message and, and like David said is there not a cause so I have a few questions what part of your life all of which belongs to God through redemption first Corinthians 6 19 and 20 what part of your life as a safe person do the things occupy or if you'd rather I say the world the world but I'm going to say Philistines where have they encamped to oppose and obstruct God's purpose for your life where have you allowed them to encamp life because that's what it they just didn't come and bombard you you willingly invited them in you gave place to the devil and the price is expensive what gi what giant do you cower down to and are you allowing the challenge of the enemy to, to go unanswered I, mean, I don't know what my voice what what impact my voice carries or the impact of the voice of any of us who preach here or, or teach here or go here I don't know what impact we have on anything other than our small world but surely our small world counts and we ought to have an impact and we shouldn't let the challenges that are that are slamming us in the face uh, because we're we feel inferior or intimidated have we allowed the enemy to convince us that we cannot make any difference then what good are we why would I why would I take the time to witness to anybody if I thought that the gospel was irrelevant and powerless or or give out the word if I thought that it's not going to make any difference people have said that why why are you doing this the way you're doing this when everybody else is doing it different who, who cares I said well God cares he's always cared and you know I've said before if we if we had to meet and had to stand on a crate in the middle of some place in the middle of the night so be it that's what we'll do but we'll give out the truth at least you know that's what I think I'm here for what we're here for the souls hang in the balance families 
relatives, neighbors. Lives are, are being influenced for God or they're being influenced for the Philistines. They just are. I mean, the reality, I can, I can deal with my neighbors and, and I understand the reality. One has a, a background with some kind of Bible with one of the parents and, and they have no use for it and the other ones have no use for God despite, you know, what their children learned. And so, if you're going to determine, you know, I'm going to stand up to him, uh, much the way like David did, then are you going to determine to go in the strength of the Lord? Because you can't go in your own strength. You can't do it. It, it just doesn't work. See, it, it does matter how we, how we conduct ourselves in this enduring boundary of blood. Because this is a bloody fight. I was going through some things and I didn't want to, I didn't want to get off on another, another little tangent. But this is a boundary of blood. And there were a lot of battles that, that took place here. In Matthew chapter 27, we find the place where uh, Judas killed himself, and it's called the field of blood. It's still called the field of blood. It could have been a small land, it could have been a little bit bigger. Uh, in uh, Revelation, we have the plain of blood. It's not called that, it's called the plain of Megiddo, which is where we get the word Armageddon. It is a plain that when we were there, you could look as far to the, to the right as you could, and, and you could, and there was no, it, the horizon went over, and you go to the other, and this is how wide the plain was. And this is where there's going to be a bleth at the end of tribulation. So much so that from Ezekiel 39 and Revelation 14, there will be destruction 181 miles wide. Of the horse's bridle. And the angel is going to call the fowl of all of the air all because it, the cleanup is going to be so massive. And it will take Israel seven months to bury the dead. The ones that are not eaten. And then we come to the atoning blood of Christ. The most precious blood, the most innocent blood, the most perfect blood. And we would look through the, the Old Testament and the sacrificial system, every, every sacrifice by represented what he was coming to do. Even the Day of Atonement, which was only for a year, represented what he was coming to do forever. This book is filled with blood. People you to take out the blood in hymns and take out the blood in scriptures, they're doing themselves a great disservice because the blood is important. And, and our warfare is a bloody warfare. And if you don't mind getting bloody, then dig in. Spiritually. Because we have to... I don't want to make trouble. I don't want to make uh, waves, so to speak. But uh, the, the truth needs to go out. And it not only needs to be believed, but it needs to be practiced and it needs to be published. And to do that, you rattle uh, people and, and they say that's hate speech. Well, the hate speech is going to come down to that if you open the book, it's hate speech. If you read a verse, it's hate speech. Uh, where do you draw the line? You, you, better, you better go back to the beginning and say, all right, I'm going to stand where God stands. And if think bad things happen, they happen, but I'm going to stand, period. Let's pray. Father, we, we are here in the midst of uh, things we don't even know about that are, have been, I believe, so blown out of proportion. We don't, we don't even know where, the, where it started. But who I am, 
I know who most of us are, and I know who you are. I've believed that from the very beginning. I don't want to be a subversive to our government, but I also don't want to be a slave to sin and to prop or think that it's okay to turn my back so that someone else can trample over my family, my relatives, my neighbors. I just pray that we would come together as your people to understand we are on one side, the enemy is on the other. And there's only one place that we can get across. It was a deep ravine, and this deep filled with blood and the blood of Christ. And we can cross over in victory because we've been granted the victory through blood. Christ's blood. It washed us from our sins. And in the Christian life, it cleanses us from our sins, the daily sins that we commit. We are, we are a people to be all about the blood and to live out our lives in, in obedience to what you have us to do. We are here to win people to you. <clears throat> but in the process, we're also to be a people to stand for you and with you. There's a great cost to being saved in, in countries that are oppressed. They know the cost. You have given us freedom, imagination, and the doors of, of oppression have made their way into Washington. They've made their ways into our governments. And they are out to take from us what is rightfully ours. I just pray we're not going to let them without a fight. And I pray that you go in our stead, in our behalf, as we go in your power. Father, if You've spoken to our hearts tonight. We just need to pray. Oh, we need to pray. We need to pray for our government, for our leaders. We're grateful for our president, grateful for our governor. There's great opposition, great, great opposition to what they're trying to do. And it's only common sense for the well-being of our, of our economic system and for our freedoms to uh, practice uh, in, in our churches. So have your way tonight. We're just grateful for what you're doing, thankful for giving us to elaborate a little bit on a, an issue that sometimes gets overlooked because we all, personally or collectively or as a nation, realize there are giants. And we cannot take care of this ourselves, believe we can, individually, trust you to see us through, because I know you will. And we pray this now in Jesus' name, amen.